Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 103, Lecture 30. In this lecture, we'll discuss the human eye. This topic is covered in Chapter 36, our textbook by Sorway and Chouette. In this lecture, we want to discuss perhaps the most important optical instrument that you've ever used, namely the human eye. The biology of the human eye is quite rich and complicated, for our purposes, we're interested only in a few specific details. As you look at the human eye from the outside, what you see is the sclera, that's the white of the eye. You also see the iris, that's the colored portion of the eye. And at the very center, you see the pupil. The pupil is the black portion of the eye. The pupil is the only part that is transparent. The iris and the sclera are mostly opaque, so light cannot pass through them. Any light that enters the eye must enter through the pupil. Light that passes through the pupil encounters the lens of the eye. For our purposes, the lens of the eye is the most important part of this picture. The lens of the eye is actually a flexible lens. It is connected to the rest of the eye through these ciliary bodies, which act essentially as muscles. So the ciliary bodies are capable of contracting and relaxing. As they do so, they change the shape of the eye. For example, if the ciliary muscles contract, then they tend to stretch the lens of the eye, in which case the eye lens becomes relatively flat, and as it becomes flat, its focal length becomes quite long. On the other hand, if the ciliary bodies relax, the lens of the eye becomes quite rounded, and as it becomes rounded, its focal length becomes quite short. This process of changing the shape of the eye and thereby changing its focal length is referred to as accommodation. Any rays of light that pass through the lens next pass through the vitreous humor. So this region here is basically filled with a transparent gelatinous substance that is composed mostly of water. For our purposes, the vitreous humor is not very important. What is important is the retina. The retina in the back of the eye consists of photosensitive cells. These cells are capable of detecting light and then sending signals to the brain via the optic nerve. So what happens when an object is placed in front of the eye? Well, every point on the object emits light rays that will go in every direction. Some of those light rays from the tip of the object will eventually enter the eye and pass through the lens of the eye. As they do so, they tend to bend or refract. And if your eye is properly focused on the object, then these rays will all arrive at a single point on the retina, forming an image there of the tip of the candle. Of course, the same thing is happening with every point on the candle, in particular, light rays emanating from, let's say, the bottom of the candle can also pass through the lens of the eye, also refract, and end up being focused at a single point on the retina again. As this process happens with every point along the length of the candle, we end up with an image of the candle on the retina. Notice that the image is actually upside down. This is quite normal. Your brain has essentially learned to interpret this upside down candle correctly. So the brain is capable of essentially flipping this image and seeing the world upright as we're used to. The ray tracing here is not very precise, so don't take this picture too literally. The point is that rays of light emanate from points on various objects. They refract through the lens of the eye and eventually arrive on the retina. Let's now discuss image formation by the eye in a little more detail. A healthy human eye can accommodate objects between a near point at 25 centimeters and a far point at infinity. What that means is that someone with so-called 2020 vision should be able to see objects that are as close as 25 centimeters, that's referred to as the near point of the eye, and as far as infinity, and that's referred to as the far point of the eye. 
Here I should explain that seeing an object clearly at infinity does not mean that you can necessarily resolve details. So if you have a healthy 2020 vision, you should be able to look at, for example, a mountain that might be 100 miles away, or even the moon, which is hundreds of thousands of miles away, and you should be able to form a clear, focused image of the moon. Now, you may not be able to see every detail of the moon. That's simply because the image does not have enough resolution. But the image that forms on the retina of your eye should be a clear, focused image. It should not be blurry. It should have well-defined edges. So for a healthy human eye, we say that the near point is located at 25 centimeters and the far point is located at infinity. People who suffer from nearsightedness or farsightedness essentially have a near point or a far point that is different from these numbers. If you happen to be nearsighted, then your far point is not at infinity, it's a little bit closer in. If you happen to be farsighted, then your near point is not at 25 centimeters, it's a little farther out. We'll discuss those two conditions in more detail a little bit later. For now, I want to point out that any image that forms must form on the retina. The retina is the only part of the eye that is actually capable of detecting light, so a healthy human eye must always form images on the retina, which is approximately 1.7 centimeters away from the lens of the eye. This is essentially something that you cannot control. This is basically the size of the human eye. From an optics point of view, what we say is that Q, the image distance, must be 1.7 centimeters. And for a healthy eye, P, which is the object distance, must range from 25 centimeters to infinity. Before going any further, let's do a simple practice problem. The human eye has a variable focal length. Recall that this is referred to as accommodation. So the ciliary muscles that are connected to the lens of the eye can contract and relax, thereby changing the shape of the eye and thus changing its focal length. In this problem, we want to calculate the minimum and maximum focal lengths that are possible for a healthy eye. A healthy eye needs to be able to properly focus and see objects anywhere between 25 centimeters and infinity. So we can say that P must be greater than or equal to 25 centimeters and less than or equal to infinity. The image distance is something that's not in your control. It's determined by the anatomy or the size of the human eyeball. So Q must be 1.7 centimeters. Given P and Q, we can calculate F using the thin lens formula. Recall that according to the thin lens formula, 1 over P plus 1 over Q is equal to 1 over F. Looking at a nearby object, something that is at the near point of a healthy eye, 25 centimeters, we find that the focal length must be 1.592 centimeters. On the other hand, if you're looking at something really far, like a faraway mountain range or the moon, then we can essentially say that the distance is infinity. Of course, the moon isn't literally infinitely far away, but compared to the dimensions of the human eye, anything more than a kilometer is really considered infinitely far. 1 over infinity is 0, and so what we find is that the focal length in that case is 1.7 centimeters. So a healthy human eye needs to be able to adjust its focal length from 1.592 centimeters to 1.7 centimeter. Notice that this is not a very large range. There is really only a difference of about a millimeter between these two numbers, and yet that one millimeter change in the focal length is enough to enable a healthy eye to see things from 25 centimeters all the way to infinity. 
So now that we know something about the focal length range of a healthy eye, we can talk about visual acuity. Visual acuity refers to the health of the eye. The eye can have many different problems, but we'll discuss only two specific problems, namely myopia and hyperopia. These are also known as nearsightedness and farsightedness. A healthy eye, 2020 vision, has a full range of focal lengths between 1.592 centimeters and 1.7 centimeters. Being able to change the focal length of the eye's lens between these two numbers enables a person to focus on objects that are as close as 25 centimeters and as far as infinity away. This does not mean that the person can resolve every detail of a far away object. It just means that the person can create a focused image on the retina that is clear with uh, sharply defined boundaries. A myopic or nearsighted eye cannot do that. A myopic eye has a focal range that is between 1.592 centimeters and some number less than 1.7 centimeters. How much less depends on how bad the eye is. If the upper limit of the focal length of your eye is something like 1.69, let's say, then your eye probably is not very bad. You can probably drive without glasses. On the other hand, if the upper limit is something like 1.6, then you have very severely myopic eyes, your vision is quite limited, and you should definitely be wearing glasses or contact lenses. The fact that the focal length can go up to some number less than 1.7 basically means that the far point is somewhere before infinity. So nearsighted people have difficulty focusing on things that are very far when they look at far away mountain ranges or the moon or some object that's generally distant. What they see is something that is fuzzy or blurry. They cannot form an image with sharply defined boundaries. The very opposite of nearsightedness is farsightedness or hyperopia. A hyperopic eye has an upper limit that is 1.7 centimeters, but its lower limit is somewhere greater than 1.592. How much greater depends on how farsighted the person is. What this means is that uh, a farsighted eye has no problem focusing on objects that are very far away, as far away as infinity, but they do have a difficult time focusing on things that are nearby. So when an object like a book, for example, gets closer than um, some limit, let's say as close as 25 centimeters, a farsighted person cannot see it. When farsighted people are reading a book or looking at a cell phone, they usually hold it farther away from their eyes than is normal. To better understand myopia and hyperopia, let's discuss what happens inside the eye. A nearsighted or myopic eye essentially has too much focusing power. We say that it has too much focusing power or that its focal length is too small. This happens because the lens of a myopic eye is essentially too round. There are many reasons why that would happen, but one reason is that the ciliary muscles have atrophied and therefore lost the ability to stretch out the lens of the eye. If these muscles have been weakened through this use, they can no longer contract as they used to and therefore cannot pull the lens of the eye flat. The lens of the eye, therefore, is essentially stuck in a round configuration and so when light enters it, the focal length is relatively small. Consider, for example, these three beams of light. Suppose they're coming in from a single point on an object. Ideally, these three rays should come to focus at a single point on the retina so that the person can see a clear, sharp point. However, because the lens is so round, the three rays are intersecting essentially too early and by the time they actually reach the retina, they are no longer forming a well-defined dot. So the person essentially sees a fuzzy or blurry image. 
To correct for this condition, we prescribe a diverging lens for the myopic eye. Recall that a diverging lens has a negative focal length. The negative focal length of the diverging lens essentially pushes the focal point of the eye further back so that it coincides with the retina. The opposite of this happens in a far-sighted or hyperopic eye. We say that a hyperopic eye has too little focusing po power or that its focal length is too large. So the problem with a hyperopic eye is that the lens is essentially too flat. There are many reasons for this, but one possible reason is that with age, the material of the lens can harden, it could lose its flexibility, and therefore lose the ability to relax and become rounded. So the eye is essentially stuck in this flat configuration. When rays of light enter the lens, they are not properly focused on the retina, they are essentially focused behind the retina. So once again, imagine three rays of light are entering the eye from a single point on the object. Ideally, we would like them to intersect right on the retina, giving us a sharp point, but they're not quite focusing there. And so by the time these three rays arrive on the retina, they leave essentially a fuzzy or large spot on the retina, again, giving the person a blurry or fuzzy image. To correct for this, we prescribe a converging lens for the person. A converging lens has a positive focal length and basically the total focal length of the prescribed lens, like the eyeglasses, and the lens of the eye together bring the focal length forward to coincide precisely with the retina. So nearsightedness and farsightedness can be corrected using diverging and converging lenses respectively. What that means is that the corrective lens and the lens of the eye together form a two-lens optical system. Recall that in our previous lecture, we discussed multi-element optical systems. We learned that when there are, for example, two lenses in series, the first lens creates an image of the object, and then the second lens creates another image of the first image. So the first image essentially becomes the object for the second lens. Therefore, we can say that the corrective lens, whether it's your eyeglasses or your contact lenses, they create an image for the eye lens, and then the eye lens creates another image of that first image, and that image should be on the retina in order for you to see things clearly. This is how the story works for a nearsighted eye. Imagine you have a nearsighted eye and imagine you have two objects. The ladybug is close by at 25 centimeters. Remember, that's the near point of a healthy eye. And the tree is supposed to be very far away, effectively at infinity. That's the far point of a healthy eye. A nearsighted person cannot see objects that are far. So the far point for this nearsighted person won't be at infinity. It'll be somewhere closer. So this eye might be able to see things clearly as far away as, let's say, 10 meters, but not beyond that. For this person, we prescribe a diverging lens. The diverging lens creates an image of the actual tree that is somewhere closer. How close should it be? Well, 10 meters. In other words, the uh, corrective lens creates an image right at the edge of the far point of this particular eye. The lens of the eye can then create an image on the retina of this image. A similar story holds for the far-sighted eye. Again, we have two objects, one close and one far. The far-sighted person has no problem seeing the tree, but the far-sighted person cannot clearly see the ladybug because it's too close. The near point for a far-sighted eye is going to be something greater than 25 centimeters, let's say 35 centimeters. So this person cannot see anything that is closer than 35 centimeters, so we prescribe a converging lens 
the converging lens creates an image of this object that is a little further back, let's say at 35 centimeters, right on the edge of the near point, and then the lens of the eye creates an image of this image on the retina. Notice in both cases, the lenses are creating virtual images. We say these are virtual images because in both cases, the image of the tree and the image of the ladybug are essentially in front of the lens. If you were to uh, substitute numbers into the thin lens equation, in both cases, you would find that Q is a negative number. So in our study of optical systems, we've encountered a large number of equations. Here, I want to summarize some of those equations and put them side by side so that you can compare mirrors and thin lenses together. In this class, we've discussed only spherical mirrors and only spherical thin lenses. So naturally, there should be many similarities between mirrors and thin lenses, but also some important differences. Since we're talking about spherical surfaces, the first thing we want to know is the radius of the surface. A mirror essentially has one surface, that's the reflecting surface, and therefore there's only one radius. A thin lens has two surfaces, the front surface and the back surface, so when discussing thin lenses, you need to specify two radii. These numbers can be positive or negative, and the rules for mirrors are the opposite of the rules for thin lenses. For mirrors, the radius is uh, considered to be a positive number when the center is in the front and negative when the center is in the back. For thin lenses, on the other hand, the radius is considered positive when the center is in the back, but negative when the center is in the front. Incidentally, when I talk about the front and back of an optical element, I'm essentially talking about the initial and final position of the rays. So look at where the rays of light start before they've reflected or refracted, and that's the front of the optical element, and then the opposite side is the back of the optical element. We use mirrors and thin lenses to focus light, and it's very important for us to know where light gets focused. That's the focal length of the mirror or the thin lens. Calculating the focal length for mirrors is relatively easy. The focal length is simply half of the radius of the mirror. Note that R could be positive or negative, and therefore the focal length can be positive or negative. For the thin lens, we have a slightly more complicated equation. This equation here is referred to as the lens maker's formula. R1 and R2 are the radii of the two surfaces of the lens. N is the refractive index of the lens. Usually lenses are made of glass, so N is usually a number like 1.5. N sub zero is the refractive index of the ambient material. So it's the refractive index of whatever material or medium surrounds the lens. Usually we think of a lens as being surrounded by air, so usually N sub zero is one. However, you could go underwater and perform underwater photography. In that case, the lens is surrounded by water so n sub 0 would be something like 1.3. The thin lens formula and the mirror formula help us figure out where the image is. So ultimately, we want to use a mirror or a thin lens to create an image of some object. We use the letter p to denote the object distance. We use the letter q to denote the image distance. And f, of course, is the focal length. Notice that the mirror formula and the thin lens formula are identical. So the mathematics of these two formulas are the same. However, each one of these numbers, P, Q, and F, could be positive or negative. There are some conventions that you simply need to memorize. P is positive when the object is in the front and negative when the object is in the back. That's the case for both mirrors and thin lenses. The conventions for Q, on the other hand, are opposite. Q is positive when the image is in front of the mirror, 
Um, however, for thin lenses, Q is positive when the image is in the back. In case you're wondering why that is, that's because for mirrors, we normally expect reflection. So we normally expect the image to be in front of the mirror. But for thin lenses, we normally expect trans, uh, transmission. Uh, we expect the light to pass through the lens. So we normally expect the image to be on the opposite side or the back side. In both cases, we're interested in magnification. Once an image is formed, we want to know things like how big is the image? Is it upright or is it inverted? For that, we need to calculate the magnification. Notice it's exactly the same formula again for mirrors and thin lenses. You need to know where the object is. That gives you P. You use the mirror formula or the thin lens formula to figure out Q. That's where the image forms and you plug those numbers in here to find the magnification. Incidentally, P, Q, and F are all always measured relative to the optical element, relative to the mirror or the thin lens. In both cases, if M is a positive number, um, the image is upright. If M is a negative number, then the image is upside down or inverted. There are some special cases that you should probably be familiar with as you do your homework and as you solve many problems, you should gradually become very familiar with how concave and convex mirrors form images and also how converging and diverging lenses form images. So in this class, we did not go through a detailed derivation of the thin lens equations. But I did mention that the thin lens equations are essentially based on the refracting surface equations. Recall that a refracting surface is any surface that separates one medium from another. So as light rays go from, for example, air into glass, the refracting surface in this case would be this spherical surface. If you're looking at fish in a fish tank, for example, light rays must travel from water essentially into air so the refracting surface would be the wall of the fish tank essentially in this class we've discussed only spherical thin lenses and so we will only discuss spherical refracting surfaces and when we have to discuss a flat refracting surface we simply view that as a circle with an infinitely large radius a refracting surface, like a mirror and like a thin lens, also has a focal length defined by this formula here. There is also a refracting surface formula which relates the object distance to the image distance. Note that this formula is quite similar to the thin lens formula, except that you see N1 and N2 in this formula because we're specifically talking about two media. You can derive the thin lens formula from two applications of this formula when you realize that a thin lens is essentially light going from air into glass and then from glass back into air. There's also a magnification formula for refracting surfaces. The formula is quite similar to that for a thin lens, but note again that you have N1 and N2 because we're specifically talking about two different media. And that is the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.